orthophosphate, one of my favorite forms of nutrients, hence why it's on the Geek Crew t-shirt. And it is because it is responsible for DNA formation, photosynthesis, literally from being born of the plant all the way to its end, orthophosphate is a part of the game. Now, orthophosphate is only one form of phosphate or phosphorus, if you will, that can be utilized by plants. And phosphorus in and of itself is number five on the 17 essential plant nutrient series, where we actually look at it as a macro, primary macronutrient, not as important as nitrogen, but whatever, integral to the plant survival. So today's video, we're gonna look at how you can actually increase the uptake of this without even adding fertilizers whatsoever, limiting factors, what deficiencies look like, and even what toxicity would look like in some cases. So let's get into it. If you're enjoying this series, you gotta hit the like button, comment down below. I just wanna check the vibes in the room to see where we're at and whether or not we like talking about nutrients this much all the way up until Christmas. So phosphorus is also considered the energy hub, I guess you could say. It's incredibly responsible for something called ATP. Now I'm not gonna get into that to too much today because it's gonna get way too nerdy, way too fast. But just keep in mind that it is incredibly important for more roles, I guess you could say, than nitrogen, uh, you could argue. So it's kind of bits and bobbed all over the ecosystem when it comes to plants. Phosphorus within the plant is somewhat mobile, meaning it's not mobile, like nitrogen is and you won't necessarily see the deficiencies at the bottom of the plant. It will be deficient kind of all over depending on environmental factors. So there's no one leaf section you can look at to determine if this is the issue. Now what makes phosphorus even more unique is that it is immobile, not mobile at all within the soil. And we're gonna talk about why that's important here in a little bit, because it actually comes down to how you're being able to fertilize and whether or not you're just throwing your fertilizer cash out the window because you're not applying it correctly. So we talked about different forms of nutrient uptake. There's passive and there's active. Phosphorus is an active form of uptake and therefore there's a little bit more work that has to go into the process of uptake, meaning you wanna make sure your hydrogen and your temps and your waters are all a little bit more dialed in to really help capture more phosphorus. When some of these things are out of whack, it can make it a little bit more difficult. So this means proper watering, making sure we're mulching, and overall just really good soil health. So one sign of deficiency that I think many of you have probably ran into is purple leaves. And now I want you to think back to the last time you started tomato seedlings indoors and what color were your leaves? very likely had a little bit of purple on them. In the case of tomato seedlings, the reason for this is because phosphorus uptake is again, affected heavily by environmental factors. For example, if it's too cold for the plant and tomatoes, obviously don't like cold. They like to be a little bit warmer. So for our seed starting setups that are in our basements or our garages, our greenhouses, just because they can be a little bit cooler, this decrease in temperature, the decrease or changes in an ideal environment actually cause the purpling of a leaf. Now this purpling of leaves can carry on obviously into adulthood if the phosphorus deficiency continues onward. Which brings me into two factors on how you would actually apply it before we actually get into toxicity because you can apply too much. So number one, probably the most obvious based on the fact that I said it was immobile or not mobile in the soil. And that is the fact that phosphorus in all cases should be as close to root placed as possible. Now, this is not seed placed, this is root placed, meaning if you're transplanting into a hole, you wanna make sure the hole is a little bit larger than the root ball and that the phosphorus is planted at the edges of kind of the divot or there's a separate space, a mid row band, if you will, where you're placing that phos for the plant to reach to. You don't want it too far to reach, but you also don't want it super duper close. And this is particularly true when we're talking about seed starting. We don't want phosphorus to be seed placed because the seed is not where bulk of the roots are gonna be. And we don't want the roots to be near that little kind of congregated spot. We want 
the roots to spread out to help with things like winds or just traffic or being able to stabilize a plant that ultimately is going to become very large towards the end of the season. So we want to make sure that the foss is root placed, meaning it's at the depth that our roots will go to. And we want to make sure that they're it's placed in a way that the roots are grabbing for it and it's not necessarily just kind of all concentrated in one space. Now number two and probably the most interesting and again I gotta try to keep this short because I did work with this at one point in my life that is mycelium fungi. This I've spoken about in length in regards to whether or not it's worth your buy or what you can buy commercially and if you should spend your money on it. Speaking from a retail perspective as a consumer there are very few actual strains of mycelium and mycelium whether it's endo or acto actually has to form a symbiosis with the plant and the symbiosis is very similar to rhizobium bacteria in the sense that it just can't willy-nilly attach onto random plants. Every plant has its own kind of mycelium friends it makes and there are so many different species that have so many different interactions with plants. This is what you can see in like the mics, the pro mixes, all that sort of stuff. And this is by all means the most universal form of mycorrhizal fungi hands down. So because of that, it does form symbiosis with a majority of plants. I was just editing this video and this popped into my head as a thought that you guys probably would like to hear this. So one of the things we would do is we would try different strains of the mycelium uh, with different types of plants in different types of soil in different types of conditions to see which ones were the most successful. Now what I will say is that something interesting that came from that was the fact that it is a technology technically. Um, it is semi-designed in a way it is selectively bred and it actually is irradiated to help ensure that there isn't any other harmful stuff in there. So it can't be used because of the radiation portion of it. It can't be used in organic growing. If you use mycorrhizal fungi on a complete technicality, that is not considered organic, which just blows my mind because I mean, what? According to Agriculture Agri Foods Canada, no dice. With all that aside, mycelium is notorious for actually helping with more phosphate capture. And it's good at it because the mycelium itself gives the conditions that actually force the phosphate out of its mineralized form that's not bioavailable and turns it into something that is bioavailable without you know, plant roots, for example, being present. This is a big driver for some people to actually add the mycelium to their, their crops. Now, I personally, if you're disrupting the soil, if you're digging the soil, if you're tilling the soil, if you're manipulating the soil in any way, it is a waste of your time because one single season, in my humble opinion, which could be nothing to you and that's totally cool if it doesn't, it's not enough time to really establish a community of mycelium that's going to ultimately make a very distinctive difference in the bioavailability turnaround of phosphorus. Now, what I will say is that if we are talking trees, shrubs, orchards, long-term perennial garden type scenarios where we have the species that has a connection to a plant, yes, I do think mycelium is valuable because we're not actually disrupting that hyphae network and it is allowed to establish over an extended period of time. So in that case, yes, ideal. Now, the other way to actually encourage the phosphate or the phosphorus to be present in the root system is to use a liquid form of fertilizer. Now, this is entirely relying on gravity to do the work for you. So when you're watering, the idea here is that the phosphorus dissolved in liquid is going to move down into the soil system. This is highly relevant to the type of soil you have. So your soil porosity, your cation exchange capacity, a sandier soil, this is going to work a lot better than a clay soil, etc. and so forth. So it's not necessarily a guarantee, but it does work. And I will say that I do use a high phosphoric high phosphorus concentration fertilizer that is liquid in my seed starting setups because the actual 
thing is small, like there's not much to it. And if you're bottom watering in particular, I know, I know the plant's getting the phosphorus, even if it's in a liquid form, because it's like right, right there. So that one is aside. Now, what I will say is that while we may be now enticed to go rip off the top layer of our soil and throw down a whole bunch of phosphate, we do want to be careful because excessive levels of phosphorus can actually show up as a zinc deficiency. So yes, this is very similar to the video we did before this on nitrogen, excess nitrogen causing a calcium deficiency. Every nutrient, when, when we get to the mineral side, like I said, there's a balance there. So more is not the merrier. You do want to take that into consideration because phosphorus will cause a zinc deficiency and you don't want a zinc deficiency. So, and you'll learn why later on when we do the rest of the series. So if you want to learn more on mycelium and whether or not it's worth your cash, this is the video you want to check out there. And that video is what Google says you should watch. So I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.